Welcome, everyone, to Trader Tuesday. I'm your host, Merritt Black. Um, the general format here and what we're doing is kind of an open q a it's it's what what we kind of call mentoring time uh for our our specific community and the broad trading community right there's no no uh barrier to get into this webinar we usually have a pretty good attendance here and we always i really mean this we always have really good questions and i sure hope that uh hope that my take and the answers are good and I guess, given the attendance uh, week after week, the, you like the answers. So, hope you know, we're glad that we're helping and we love doing this. I love doing this. So uh, let's get into it. Please use the Q&A box. I guess it's the only functioning thing you can click um, to uh, submit the questions. We'll take them on a first come, first serve basis and uh, let's hop into it. I just got so lucky, by the way. I decided to change brokerages for kind of a um, um, a longer term portfolio type thing. And, um, you know, it's all like swing trading kind of, it's not like I'm, you know, and it's pretty new. So I understand that I could have done like an ACAT transfer or whatever, but I just decided to like flatten every, all my positions and everything that I've been holding since like the 25th, 26th of July. And it was right before this, everything started tanking. Um, pure luck. So please use the Q&A um, and uh, we'll take those questions. They're already starting to come in. Lewis says, hey, Merritt, uh, today I had a good read on the ES after the failure of the imbalance and the break of the CVAL. My question is whether DVA is more important than MP or CP levels. Um, I don't know what C, oh, C, composite. Uh, when it comes to accessing the idea of trading, i.e. trading. Well, I mean, that's that's kind of difficult to answer. I mean, it's, on one hand, it's straightforward. On the other hand, maybe I'm even confused as to, to the, what the real question is here. So, I mean, it's a top-down approach that funnels all the way down into, let's call it an entry, right? Or it could be an exit. We could draw different models for different decision-making, right? But it all funnels into spitting out, do we have an entry? And other times, you don't have an entry, so it doesn't funnel you down to an entry, right? Well, guess what? I mean, what you're asking is, you know, what, what, what really starts this thing off? And it's context, right? So by design, the fact that it occurs first and really sets the tone and tells us what we're even potentially interested in or not interested in anything or super interested in something or kind of interested in something, if other things really check out and look good, that's context. That's the narrative read, right? Nadro, it all starts with in narrative. So when you're asking whether DVA quote is more important than the MPCP levels. Well, of course not. No way. Right. Like the thing that's most important is, you know, our long-term view apps and our market profile stuff and volume profile for people who lean on that and, 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 and so on. Right. Maybe all the way down to like an overnight distribution. Right. Which again is profile. Um, if if you've got something there, right, it's kind of like if we're funneling towards an entry, no, right? If you've got a yes, well, then guess what? Now now we start to to work towards DVA, towards order flow, you know, these kind of things as we, as we you know, rhythm, as we get towards um, an entry decision or an entry uh, action. The thing that throws me off about your question is you said, is the DVA more important than the profiles levels when it comes to accessing the idea? So it's kind of an impossible question to answer, which is why I was a little confused is because, well, yes, DVA is more directly involved in accessing the trade idea, right, than, than market profile. But there would be no trade idea in existence without the market profile, for example, right? So 
kind of a chicken or the egg there in a sense, or, or that's probably a bad analogy, but you get what I mean. So you understand the hierarchy there. You understand what's more important. You understand that it's a top-down approach that flows through all the way to where we have a, a potential entry. So I hope that helps uh, Lewis. As always, guys, feel free to follow up. I'm sorry. Again, we don't have the chat. I've already changed the settings now. So we'll have it next week for sure. Um, but if you do have follow-up, then uh, just put it into the Q&A. All right. I remember Govindaraj uh, from last week. Looks like he's hit us with another doozy this week. Um, question regarding open. Do you trade the open of the session? Uh, my answer is yes. So 1A, if yes, how do you trade? What strategy do you use? Um, so it's so Govindaraj, you're you're obviously new to Apteros, you're new to me. Um my strategy is all over the internet. It's called Nadro, N-A-D-R-O. Start by going to apterostrading.com and take a look at the Nadro course, which is a methodology, right? So um, go listen to, um, if we had the chat, somebody could link this, but you will be able to find it. Go check out some of my... Um, uh, podcast that I've been on with Alpha Mind, with Anthony Crudelli's Futures Radio. Um, I talk in detail about what my methodology is and kind of how I trade. So I think we'll allow you to go access that, you know, free material there um, and whatnot. But I, I, I trade a NADRO methodology. I would say for your 1A3 question, um, I'm neither swing nor scalp. I will swing sometimes, but it's more rare. I will scalp sometimes, but that's slightly more rare than what I, what I would refer to as my bread and butter trading, which is what I call intraday position trading, right? So each day, well, I haven't done it as much lately, but over the past few years, I've put out a pre-market prep almost every day and what I'm trying to do is get positioned from key areas when I have um, and from where I have a directional bias and a really good line in the sand to lean on as a risk reference, right? I know quickly where I'm wrong relative to the distance to if I'm right. So I look to get into trades from really good, what we call trade locations, really good places and allow them to work. So, and I'm typically flat at the end of each day. So that's not scalping and that's not swing trading it's somewhere in between the two and then finally i think the last part to answer here because all the b questions are are if i said no to the thing what is your suggestion for beginners regarding the open it depends on what methodology you're trading depends on if you're scalping depends on if you're swing trading um my general rule of thumb is to tell people don't be afraid of the open. Don't avoid the open. Um, you know, my, my general advice is time is just a spectrum, you know, it's just we're marching along. Uh, for me, if conditions are right, if I have a setup, I don't care if it's right at the opening bell. I don't care if it's during lunch hour. I don't care, you know, if it's overnight. Um not that I'm always, you know, trading overnight and whatnot, but the point is, is that if I could just sit here and trade, you know, 23 hours a day, then I don't care when the, 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 my setups occur, I'm taking them. Um, now this is very easy for you to start to get some sample size and correct. If there's a problem, if you're getting destroyed on the open, well, typically the problem is not trading the open. The problem is how you're trading around the open. Right. If you think you can just, unless you're really quick, unless you're very proficient in like, you know, trading with hotkeys and you're not fumbling around with a mouse, you know, trying to click and change your quantities and, you know, make orders, you're never going to be quick enough to trade the open. 
So let's say you're trading hotkeys. Let's say you're proficient with that. Let's say you are skilled in perhaps momentum type trading, which is what people do around the open, right? Opening drives, things like that. Um, a lot of people trade the open, they just get wrecked because it's volatile. Well, that either means one of two things. That either means your stops are too tight, right? Your trade management is is um, like, for example, you know, it comes into the open and you say, all right, boom, I'm going to get long here. And you say, well, I'm just going to put the stop right here below this. Well, wh what do we know that happens around the open a lot of times? Well, it's just this kind of stuff, right? So a lot of times people are getting stopped out and, and they're complaining about the whipsawing around right that, at that opening bell. So obviously if you're swing trading and you're having really, really wide stops, well then guess what? It doesn't really matter because you're not trying to be as precise. What I think a lot of the best traders do is we enter the open is they say, okay, I want to get long. And even if it's going to come back and whipsaw them, they're saying, take profits, boom, starts to turn, take heavy profits, if not flatten, right? Maybe even put in a protective stop or whatever, maybe trailing stop, all kinds of things. They're not getting stopped out here on a full position, right? Even if this whole move happens in 10, 15 seconds total, they're quick enough, they're good enough, right? So a lot of factors here for you to consider. Um, but as I mentioned, explore it and see what your result like all traders all we can do is try things that have a methodology and a process to them otherwise it's just randomness you might as well not track anything or try to get better because it's all who knows what you're doing right do something repeatable track it and look at ways and areas that you can adjust and improve and build from strengths and lessen the effect or 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 improve upon weaknesses all that kind of stuff that's what we do all right graham says simple question don't laugh uh maybe i'm overthinking it you, this sounds like a question i would ask someone on on a webinar like this um i know there's a strategy called stop run played by various organizations for example the market's trending down making lower lows and lower highs Possible short entry would be on a pullback with a stop loss above the recent lower high. Price stalls, then wicks higher, takes out all the stops at the same level of your stop. Shouldn't the direction continue going higher since the stops are longs? And I'm gonna I'm gonna take that to mean since we're this is a downward moving market, the stops are buy orders, right? They are not longs, they are actually short covering. Right. So they're buy orders, but that's different than a long. So I'm going to correct that that terminology there. Uh, why does the market continue lower? Would this be due to people re-entering, which would assist in the down move? So, you know, first of all, Graham, I think this is great that you're thinking about markets this way. Right. You're moving beyond just like. RSI and stochastics or even price. And you're considering what people are doing, right? You're actually looking deeper into what we call kind of the auction process and people making decisions. And I love that. So this is by this is far from a dumb question. The answer, I'm going to go ahead and give you the quick and dirty answer. The answer is all kinds of things happen in different situations. Sometimes it does keep going higher. So we can't say why does it not go higher. Um but I guess we'll answer your question as to the times where it does not go higher. Why doesn't it? Um, so anyways, we got a market that's doing this, you know, just so you guys understand, we short here and it comes out and runs stops above this high. And then it continues. Okay. In the markets that I trade, S&P, NASDAQ, currencies, energy space, crude oil, um, my experience trading stocks, 
this type of movement with this little stop run that occurred, it, it's almost more common than uh, um, uh, this, where it just goes up and just turns and it's all, you know, so perfect and straightforward and neat and tidy. So I think you need to just kind of like wake up to the reality of how often these kind of things happen. I think that's that's step one here. Um, why you know why does it continue going lower? Well, it continues going lower here. You got to compartmentalize, right? We can zoom in and assess what happened during this sequence where we had this move that did this, right? What happened here? Well, the only way I know as to what happened here, other than from a price action perspective of a little what we call up thrust pattern that fails above a prior swing high, the only thing I can look to, well, is to zoom out to other price actions. So for example, let's say that we've got this nice little area right here, and let's say it's a nice level. Well, guess what? Let's pretend it went all the way up to it. Sometimes you get levels that get retested, right? So maybe it wanted to turn here, but you got a lot of resting liquidity up here and stop outs placed right there because people who are short from this breakdown right here, they place their stops at break even once it goes in their favor. They say, all right, my stop was up here or up here. Well, now I'm going to move it to like break even plus one. And guess what? Their stops get hit. So we could go on and on and on. Right now, let's just say that this is a two-minute chart. We're just an analyzing what happens here, and then we analyze what happens here. What if I went to a 15-minute a, a chart? What if I went to a 30-minute chart? What if I went to a daily chart? There are all kinds of participants making all kinds of decisions and, and, and orders for all kinds of reasons all over the place. So while I'm I'm happy that you're thinking about the the mechanics, the auction mechanics of people stopping out and why I get the sense that you're also going a little too far with asking why like for example the market continued lower. We never want to ask why the market continued lower. You know, you want to go to look at like CNBC or something. I bet they'll tell you an answer while the market's down, right? But it's bullcrap. It's total bullcrap. Sometimes technically they might be right, right? If, if you know, all of a sudden some, you know, data comes out and all of a sudden the job market is, you know, just terrible and it's so a surprise. Yeah, they're correct that that news is kind of why the market's down. Most days, they're saying, well, the market's down. What can we find out there that is a reason for that? The market's up. What can we find out there, you know, for our headline, stocks up on XYZ reason, right? It's crap. So anyways, um, even from a technical auction market theory perspective, our, que our, our question is to really find out what is what is happening, right? You And you told me there's a downtrend, as we call an imbalance down for real auction theory people. Um, and this is nothing but a continuation of that. The fact that there was a little micro stop run in this little sequence, the fact that there was a retest of a prior swing low in this bigger sequence, those are just small factors within the fact that this is just um, an imbalance that is occurring. And then guess what? As I mentioned, when we zoom out and we look at a daily bar and, and, and a 240 minute chart or whatever, there's going to be all kinds of like contextual what is. So for me, I think it's really, 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 really important that I compartmentalize what's going on contextually. And then again, compartmentalize what's going on short term. I know how to use multiple timeframes effectively, and they each have certain job descriptions. That's really important. People get a little lost and confused when they try to put multiple timeframes together, um, and they do a lot of dumb things. 
they make wrong decisions based off of wrong timeframes. They have their job descriptions of what the timeframes are most useful for messed up or backwards or random. So anyways, I could talk for about six hours about uh, the, your question here. Um, but you are correct in that, well, maybe this is just a continuation of a down move. Maybe it's not that significant. Uh, yes, maybe some people re-entered here. Yes, maybe some people had resting limit orders to even sell up here. So when the stop run did occur, there was liquidity. Maybe we see a little bit of absorption, right, on the order flow. So that's the final piece, I think, as we zoom in even further to maybe the lower time frame, right? So we have our context above. We have our trading time frame, which we're analyzing trend and making decisions. And then we have our lower time frame. And for me, that's not like a price action lower time frame. It's what's happening on the tape, the order flow. Who's being aggressive where? Um, if you're asking questions about who's doing what and why kind of, order flow is going to be um, very nice for you to uh, give you some additional color as to what's happening beyond just open high low close of price action anyways hope that was helpful uh not a dumb question a great question uh angel or inhale i'm not sure which says tips on identifying or adapting faster on change in narrative or rhythm during the day uh rhythm shouldn't really be an issue to adapt because it's just, right, sometimes market's moving like this. And then all of a sudden, you know, maybe it starts to open up, right? And like by, by the time there's a couple rotations in, we kind of establish this as the new normal. And this is kind of the old situation, right? So that shouldn't be too hard to adapt to. In fact, if you look at the S&P today, it's exactly like I didn't even mean to do that. But the S&P on, for me, a 3,000 volume chart, Right today, it looked like this. And then all of a sudden, it starts to kind of open up. Right. So there you go. Kind of had a rhythm shift. Um, and, you, you know, there is no like fixing it in hindsight. You, you know, you have to allow the hard right edge to evolve and the rhythm to to evolve, um, you know, and, and, and read that um what was the other part of the question oh it, i think it was acceptance right well change in narrative so that's what we refer to as um shifts in acceptance really so i mean first of all a change in narrative is going to be very different on different days right sometimes i have for those of you who've been following my DMIs, I might have a bull one zone here. I might have a bull two kind of zone here, right? So the, the fact is, is that this creates more ambiguity. I will write in my DMI what I think about what if we get below bull zone one. It might be a short scalp opportunity. It might be that if bull one breaks down, um, it's bearish, but kind of you may want to use bull two as a place to like sca um, uh, scale out and, and be caution, right? Or it might be a, 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 a no trade, right, to the downside if we hold below bull one, right? The, the, the DMI might say if we break and hold below bull one, monitor for a long right and the bull the bulls to stabilize us around bull zone two so my point here is the the change the hold below bull zone one on different days whether or not there's even a bull zone two or not might mean different things some days we come in and we have a major line in the sand, right? And we're about to open below here. So it's typically going to be a bear zone. And the DMI might be short and sweet. It might say, great short opportunity, bearish, as long as we're holding below here, bullish above. 
right? That's nice and clean. That's a day where you don't have something else just above here to cause confusion. It's simple. We're bearish. We're bearish. We're bullish, right? So it depends on the context. It depends on how clean of a line in the sand you have for the area for that for that day for that session. Uh, Kulu, what's up, Kulu? Um, he said, "Hey, M, if you were doing the tryout, would you trade? Would you trade manage differently? Would you manage your trades differently than your live account because of the PNL target?" Not methodology, of course, but the trade management. I think I would. I think that I would put less dependence upon the big, full narrative completion winners. And I would be a little more protective of open PL. Right? Number one, I'm trying to kind of build up my days under my belt, right? Because there's a minimum days requirement. So let's book some green. Let's count it as a day, right? Um, now, I'm not talking about scalping for a tick here, right? I'm talking about a meaningful P&L at, at which we get to, let's say, some, as we call, intermediate destination rather than the main narrative destination. Um, and you're up 3R. I mean, like, book it right? That's what I would do in, in the trial. I would take meaningful profits off the table. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, right? That's what I would do. In my own trading, I am very comfortable, despite the pain at times, of giving back a lot of open p &L because, um, I like to hold at times where, where appropriate contextually, I like to hold a, a nice large core position and give it room to work and allow it. If you, there's no, there's no one without the other. You can't have your cake and eat it too. If you're going to give a large core position room to work, you are allowing open PNL to large open PNL to evaporate. Right. And I, I would change that a little bit about uh, if I was in the trial. Uh, a space AA asks, hi, Merritt was wondering if you trade agricultural commodities, softs, meats, grains, intraday scalp or not. Sure. Not a lot of them. Um, I don't currently subscribe to ice, so I don't trade, you know, most of those softs. I, I think those are, these days are mostly there, but I mean, um, you know, certainly a lot of CBOT products, right? Um, not a lot, but you know, um, certainly, um, grains, I guess, actually, uh, soybeans, corn, um, and then obviously some, you know, some comex metals, um, some Nymex, you know, energy products, but anyways, soft meats, grains, pretty much just grains for me. Um, I'm not saying the, the others are bad markets. Quite frankly, I've just always had a little bit of a problem with ICE and um, the fact that they decide to not give retail traders um, any break on fees. Not that, not that I would get those, but um, I don't know. ICE is weird, right? Like, why? What, what are you doing? Anyways, um, I don't even subscribe to ICE data at the moment. I've been thinking about it, though. I have been. Uh, can a non-student join your community? No. Uh, you can join the non-student version of the community, which is essentially just access to these webinar recordings and um, uh, the DMIs, uh, our pre-market prep. Um, but in terms of the real community, the real community is for our students. So you have to be a student to be in the community. Uh, Mauricio says, hi, Merit. If I take the NADRA course, do I have to use MP to use your method or could I use other tools, not necessarily MP? You could absolutely replace MP with VP, okay? 
you could use volume profile instead of market profile. That would that would be certainly fine. Uh, Baltazar says, hey, Marit, thanks for all the things you do for us. Will you start posting DMIs more regularly after summer? Uh, yeah, I, I, I need to get back on that. Um, you know, I was sick and then I've had a crazy schedule and, um, you know, I've, I've got, you know, not like, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong, nobody worry, uh, but, you know, some, some major, uh, you know, changes and things, uh, personally, so um, the DMIs have just gone to the back burner, unfortunately, the past couple of weeks. Um, but no, I'm, I'm going to get back on those. Don't worry. Uh, Jeff says, I think he doesn't have a methodology. That's why he's asking for yours. Yeah, I understand that. But this is not a webinar where I can explain my entire methodology. And there's a bunch of free resource, resources out there for him to learn a lot about what I do. So I, I, that's why I pointed him in that direction. Uh, hey, Merritt, do you use NADRO to trade treasury bond futures? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. One more question. Out of, we got probably a dozen. Um, We got Cicero in the house. Let's uh let's give him let's let's give him the last question here. Uh hey bud, hope all is well. Following up on that question just now about I, I'm sorry if I missed your question somewhere. Um oh oh following up on a question here prior. Okay. Uh about doing things differently for a tryout. Just wondering if you have any observations about current conditions, generally speaking. Anything meaningful stand out lately? Um, great question, right? Someone, someone, someone should ask that question every week, right? Or every, every month or something, but that's something you know, like you guys want some real insight from me. You should probably say, what's tell me, Merritt, what's your view on kind of the current conditions and, and how you're, you know, tweaking your, your tactics to, to, to excel, you know, um, in, in these current conditions. So this year, um, for me, things have been more, um, more scalpy, more momentum, you know, cause we've been in a higher vol environment. Um, you know, the ES has been, you know, first failing from an imbalance and then imbalance down for the year. And, and whatnot. So um, it's been re some really good conditions for that. A couple of swing trade opportunities. Most recently, uh, kind of from the recent lows, the S&P offered beautiful like swing long type uh, type deal. So up it. So I'm in the middle of a transition right now to where I think that I'm going to be holding positions longer again. I think that the S and P in general has gone all clear bull, right? I think the the S and P um, for the first time this year, I think the low is totally in, right? And we don't have to take out the low for that to change. It's around you know that thirty nine hundred. Um, remember thirty nine oh six? Remember me? talking about that on Twitter and DMIs, you know, back in what April as a downside target, right? Well, guess what? We've, we've recovered that area now finally and gotten back above it for the first time since we got back below it in June. So I'm thinking, you know, a little bit lower vol. I'm thinking um, hold positions a little longer rather than kind of in and out, um, kind of move to move stuff because the volatility is is has been high. Um, so I'm in kind of a transition phase now where I'm looking to kind of hold things for like get back to kind of normalcy for me. Um, to be that I, this is at the hard right edge, right? This is a very fresh condition. Um, I think the S and P's in a nice spot here where if we can get below like 4080, I think that we see a healthy correction, right? Maybe all the way back to 
3908 or whatever, right? Um, so I think we're getting a little heavy up here uh, short term, but I think it's coast is clear for, for bulls, right? Now, guys, don't do not mistake me. I know Matt, you know, understands, you know, what I'm saying here very clearly and, and within the context of me and who I, who I am and what I think and, and how I trade. But for those of you who don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not, and no one you should ever listen to is kind of a crystal ball person, right? Just because I say the lows in for the year, who gives a crap, right? Like I might short, I might do nothing but short stuff for the rest of the week, right? As I said, I think we're heavy here. I think we need a pullback. So I'm not making predictions. I'm not, you know what I mean? I'm letting you know what the NADRO methodology on my charts from a top-down approach of multiple timeframes is telling me, right? I think swing long is, is in play. I think, um, right, like big picture, right? If you want to put a stop below the low of the year, right? Like that kind of thing. Uh, otherwise, I think we're due for a little bit of downside um, below, if we start to hold below like 40, 80. Um, anyway, so Matt, I think that my, the big thing for me is less, I, I'm transitioning to less move to move and kind of starting to hold for some bigger targets and whatnot, which I I moved away from in the higher vol environment. And trust me, I sure do hate to see uh, volatility go away, right? It's not a, not a view that I want to have, but, but it, it's, what, it's what I'm seeing. And I, look, I'm not a guy who follows VIX every day and stuff. So, I mean, I'm sure the VIX has come off with the S&P higher, but like, you know, a lot of people are saying, uh, you know, still a bear market, you know, like these are just like little squeezes and relief rallies and stuff. My charts tell me that we've, we've transitioned to, to sideways to bullish, but with the risk reward being skewed in the favor of bullish at the moment. All right, guys. I hope you walked away with something today where you feel like you learned a little something. Thanks for being here. Thanks for all your great questions. And we will see y'all next week. Cheers.